This video was not sponsored by Startup Chile or Dream Adventures or 500 Startups. Not directly, at least. But all three of them invested in Slidebean and helped us get our company to where it is today. My co-founders and I all went through these programs as we started the company. We ended up living in Santiago, Chile, then New York City, and finally in the Bay Area, aka Silicon Valley. In this video, we are going to look into what startup accelerators are, choosing a program that is worth it for you, or deciding if you should skip them altogether, and finally, how to get in. This is Startup Accelerators. So the first thing that accelerators will appreciate is that you don't get them confused with the concept of an incubator. An incubator, like Ehrlich, is a mostly outdated model where companies can benefit from the program for a significant amount of time. You just admitted to starting a competing incubator. I've caught you in a web of your own lies, haven't I? I don't think so. Wait. Have you? Incubators can still be seen in academia, where students or graduates get access to office space and mentoring. An accelerator, on the other hand, is usually a three or four month program that looks actually to accelerate companies. Most accelerators provide some capital so that the startups can invest more freely and take a percentage cut on the company, either as equity or as future equity in the form of a safe or convertible note. Go watch our video on convertible notes. The infrastructure of an accelerator is typically one or more physical offices where companies can work to, for the duration of the program, though programs like Y Combinator don't offer a physical space, so it's more of a remote kind of program. Managing partners and or entrepreneurs in residence, which work directly with the founders by meeting with them every week, aside from their managerial tasks. Then uh, a network of mentors, some closer than others. The closest ones are regularly in the office space and can assist companies with specific topics such as ad management or pitch and design practice, analytics. The rest of the mentors are available for occasional one hour calls on a first come first serve basis, but you shouldn't count on being able to speak to them very often. Finally, a network of investors. So there is by no means a guarantee that you will receive funding by getting into an accelerator, but you can get intros to most of them through the accelerator staff, which does open a lot of doors compared to trying cold emails. Choosing a program. As I said, we've been through Startup Chile, Dream Adventures and 500 Startups. The latter two, according to this diagram by seedrankings.com, fit into the silver and gold categories. We'll get back to this in a second. Startup Chile doesn't show up in the chart because the model is a little different. So let's start with them. Startup Chile provides companies with a grant funded by the government of Chile to promote entrepreneurship in the country. Chile seeks to become a startup hub in South America. So the government allocates about $35,000 for each company, for founders to get their ideas off the ground. Over 200 companies are accepted each year, which means that this is a government investing about $8 million a year building this startup hub, and they've done it for a good amount of years now. We are part of batch eight of Startup Chile from November 2013 to June 2014, a six month program. Actually relocated the team to Chile, which is a requirement to participate. Most companies coming into the program are early or idea stage, so if you don't have any traction yet, this might be possible for you to get in. The program is more of an incubator where you get free office space for six months, some access to mentors and investors, but you're mostly on your own. Each company makes the most out of it in their own way, but it's essential that you come in with your objectives and your expected milestones very clear. Now, you don't have to give any equity in exchange for the grant, but you're expected to get involved with the local community by organizing meetups and events, which is a very fair deal if you ask me. Now you'll likely be able to find other government grants like this one in nations that are just getting started with their tech ecosystems. I don't know any specific ones, but feel free to share any you know in the comments. Let's move to Dreamit. So Dreamit is classified as silver in this chart. Having been through the program, I can speak firsthand about what they do, which I expect will be comparable to other programs in this silver category. Now, Dreamit used to invest $25,000 in exchange for 6% of common company stock. So they used to target early stage pre-revenue companies and focus on their pitch decks, the story, and the product launches. This is when we went through it. They have since evolved and doubled down on some specific industries where they have the connections to make a difference for the startups. And those are urban tech, health tech, and secure tech. Companies are no longer required to relocate. Instead, the program is remote and they go on a customer sprint about halfway through the program, and then an investor sprint towards the end. The industries Dreamit serves require a network to be able to find the right person inside a large company enterprise to become interested in this new innovative product that the startups might be building. So their investment and equity requirements vary from company to company, but they have focused their model on coming in at the same terms as the investors they help you find. So 
to be able to get in front of customers by week seven, companies need to have a live product by the time they come into the program. Dreamin is a much more structured program than Startup Chile. Also, of course, more selective. They only take about 10 companies from each industry every year. Now, when Slidebean went through Dreamin, I used most of my professional time to meet with their investor network. Most of my time went to getting meetings and pitching investors. Well, that experience served me well for what Slidebean has become today, and then I can pass it on to you. It didn't get us any funding during the program. We got out of Dreamin with about $1,500 in monthly recurring revenue, which was, of course, not enough traction to prove that this presentation product was going in the right direction. Which brings me to 500 startups. We had our doubts about applying, but ended up going for it. At the beginning of October 2014, we were three weeks away from running out of cash when we got a call from 500 inviting us to the interview. It wasn't a question on whether or not we needed another accelerator. 500 startups' $100,000 investment was really the only cash that we had access to. The deal back then was a $100,000 investment out of which 25,000 were paid back for the actual accelerator program. So they have a safe type of document that guarantees them 7% of company stock using the same preferred stock terms as the next qualifying round of financing. I believe these terms have changed lately, but and the, their original investment is probably closer to 150,000 these days. 500 startups ended up being the last push we needed to get the company off the ground. Their growth focused program consists of two weekly meetings with an entrepreneur in residence. So EIRs are successful entrepreneurs or early employees of successful companies who have first-hand experience in companies at exactly this stage. There's also a weekly meeting with the Growth Council. That's not their name, but that's what they are. A team of four or five growth hackers that help you crack your head about growth tactics for your business. 500 Startups expects their companies to come in with a few thousand dollars in revenue and to scale that exponentially during the program. A hockey stick chart is an expectation. Now, our friends from Headout, a company from India, came into the program with $30,000 or so in monthly revenue and got out with close to $100,000 a month. That's just three months of incredible growth. On the other hand, their philosophy revolves around giving opportunities to unlikely entrepreneurs. So that's foreign founders or women-led teams. There is no non-profit altruistic reasoning behind it, I think. On the contrary, they believe that they can get more for their buck by investing in companies that might be overlooked by other firms and VCs. But it serves you well if you are in that group. Now, raising funding after the program ends is, once again, not a guarantee. 500 Startups gets you good press and credibility, but in the end, it's up to you and your metrics. Now, looking at this chart, I have never been through a platinum level program, but my perception for, say, 500 Startups versus Y Combinator is that Y Combinator provides a much stronger brand name, let's agree to that, access to a stronger network of investors. And then since Y Combinator has accelerated so many successful companies, you are inevitably pre-filtered as you start getting into these meetings. By the number of applicants and acceptance rate, it is harder to get into Y Combinator or 500 startups than getting into Harvard. I rarely get to brag about that. Choosing the program that is right for you relates exactly to getting in. On a failed YouTube show we launched a couple years ago called Startups and Spirits, we asked Elizabeth Ian, a former managing partner, why we got in. So here's that video. Do you I, remember why I, we got in? It's because we were so early, we were so lost. I do remember. So you guys were pretty early, but I think you had a decent number of users, but you were charging you know, a certain amount and it wasn't from a revenue standpoint a whole lot. But one of the things that we are looking for in the application process. Does the company understand who their target customer is and what could be the unit economics around this? Like what is it now and what do we think it could be? And so it's not so much that we're looking for a hard and fast number and this is why it's so hard to say, oh, if you hit X, like then you're in because that's certainly not the case. It really depends a lot on the vertical, but in your case, for Slidebean, you know, there's presentation software out there already. We already understand, like, okay, there's a market for it. We understand how much people are willing to pay for this at other companies. And do we think that this is a great product that can potentially disrupt that? And you had the user base to show that actually people really loved your product. And that was more or less what we were looking for there. And the question is, for us was, could we help this company, if they came into the badge, could we help them, say, optimize their revenue? Like maybe it's just as simple as pricing changes, or maybe it's as simple as, you know, what the value proposition is or whatnot. And actually I think 
that proved out to be true. You guys have exploded since then, and, and we had a couple of thoughts, and then you guys ran with it. But that's the kind of thing we're looking for, where we think if we have some little insight that we think we can help with, and the team can just run with it, then that's like the, the magical situation. Oh, thanks. Thanks, for, so. thanks for accepting <laughs> us, actually, because uh, it made the whole difference. We, we would be out of business if we hadn't been into 2500. So that's your answer from the source. It's about finding the program that is right for your stage, knowing your numbers, knowing your unit economics, having some proof that the product is needed, and very importantly, being able to tell that story for which you will need a pitch deck. We help companies with their pitch deck, either with our self-service AI and design platform, you can sign up for free using the link in the description, or by getting involved in the writing and designing, which is done by me. Even though we have a team of 25 plus people, I like to get involved with these stories and help, you know, I've, I've been through it and, you know, raised capital and so on. So some more info on that on this URL. Now, let's move into the questions for this week. All right, so first question from Paul Thomason. What is the rule of thumb traction ARR, annual recurring revenue, that a bootstrapped SaaS company needs to have, I guess, to have a fighting chance of doing a seed round of $1 million for 10% of the company. How important is profitability compared to, compared to ARR? Thanks for the great content. You're very welcome. So, uh, you know, you have to translate this to valuation, right? If you want to raise $1 million and give away 10% of your company, then that translates to a company valuation of around $10 million. What, how, what makes a company worth $10 million, right? Uh, in the traditional sense, that would mean that you're generating somewhere close to that amount of revenue. But in the startup world, you might not need that much revenue. But what you do need is, I want to say at least one or one point five million dollars of annual run rate as a SaaS company, um, and prove that you're still growing, right? So that you not only got to one million, one million and a half uh, dollars of ARR, but that you're continuing to grow at say. 2.5 or th I mean 250 or 300% annually. Um, I'm not making this up. There are a couple blogs uh, that I commonly and regularly read on, on how these valuations are working. I'm gonna link I'm gonna link them in the description and they're gonna show up here. The team is gonna have them. Uh, but yeah, I guess that those are ballpark figures. Next question from Duncan. Um, how did you manage to keep track of your team since they are not all in one place? I want to figure out how viable it is to leave my team in Europe and maybe apply for Startup Chile, for instance. Uh, that's a great question. I was not a big fan of um, remote teams up until recently, uh, mainly because I think that there is some irreplaceable value of the of collaborating inside the office. Uh, but in the in the last few months and years, I've softened up and I've seen how if you have the right team, if you have the right kind of people uh, that are able to work remotely, then that might even work better, right? So they're not wasting time in traffic. They're not wasting time getting to the office. They're happy because they can work chill at home. Uh, but not everybody works in that way. You know, some people need some more direct kind of like micromanagement supervision. That's not the way we work. So we have the advantage of hiring people that are very proactive and very self-sufficient. And it was easy to put them into a work from home sort of uh, environment or, you know, work from a completely separate location. Uh, it's a, it's just about hiring the right people to work um, in that sense, not about worrying about how to manage them. You're not going to have time to manage them if you're on the other side of the world in a different time zone. And then the last question by Jake Rageman. Would you recommend taking an expensive growth hacking course to find a better product market fit? I would not. I would not recommend it. Uh, I mean, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so I think that growth hacking is something that you have to learn by doing. Um, it's tough. Uh, a lot of the stuff I know today about growth hacking is based on trial and error. Uh, so having the company, the product, and the budget to run experiments uh, in which some experiments worked and some experiments didn't is what ended up making me a better growth hacker and a better marketer. Um, and I think that that's inevitable for everybody. You have to kind of experience things for yourself and then you know, see if this campaign that you once ran for X company applies to this other company. And, and you remember a little bit of the unit economics of that campaign. Um, you know, the course might be useful. I can't, you know, I can't really say yes or no. If it's expensive, I would say no. All of the stuff that I know about growth hacking, I learned online for free, reading blogs and, and again, trial and error sort of thing. I think that you get much more value out of, a, I don't know, an internship with a, with a great growth hacker than, than just paying for a course. It's, that's just my take. That's all we have questions for today. So remember, if you have more questions, shoot them in the comments and we'll try to answer them. We answer about three every week. 
we have the startup t-shirt thing. So if you want me to wear your startup company t-shirt on one of these videos, check the link in the description, send us one of your t-shirt over, one of your t-shirts over, we'll send one back from Slide Bean, that's a nice exchange, but then I'll wear it and talk about your company in the next video. We have some lined up already. All right, that's all for today. See you next week. <laughs>